Hi, and welcome to the podcast on consciousness with Bernard Bars. Open minded conversations on some new ideas about the scientific study of consciousness and the brain. I'm Nat Geld, this show's producer. Here's a question for you How do you think about the idea of subjectivity? The term subjectivity goes back more than 2,500 years, and the scientific study of sensory subjectivity is usually thought to go back about 200 years, when sensory psychophysics and sensory physiology started to study hearing, vision, and touch. Every electronic gadget you will ever use depends on those years of sensory science, called psychophysics. The word psycho means mind or consciousness, and physics means the physical world, but it also means body and nature. The field of sensory psychophysics is about nature as experienced through the senses. I'm sure that our special guest today, psychophysicist Stanley Klein, will elaborate on all this in this episode. Our guest today, Stanley Klein, is Professor of Vision Science and Optometry at the University of California, Berkeley. His major area of research has been neurotechnology, a field of science that studies the body and mind through the nervous system by electronics and mechanisms. Our host, of course, is psychobiologist Bernard Bars, originator of Global Workspace Theory, GWT, and one of the founders of the modern science of consciousness. Also joining us is our resident student interviewer, Ilian Daskalov, who is completing his final undergrad year this week in cognitive neuroscience at UC Irvine. Hi, Bernie. Hi there. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Ilian. Hi, Nat. Good morning. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you here, too. Welcome, Stan. We're so happy you could join us. How are you today? I'm doing fine. <laughs> great, great. It's great <laughs> to see your smiling face. Well, we'd love for you to please tell us about yourself and elaborate on your research and expertise over these many decades. It is so fascinating. We can't wait to learn more about you and what drives your curiosity and what you've learned throughout these years. We'd also like to layer in a question for you at the top, which is where we began today. Our first question that we'd like you to discuss with us and our listeners is, how do you think about the idea of subjectivity? Oh, that's very, very simple to answer, which is that present science doesn't know how subjectivity is produced in the brain. It's one of the main mysteries. And so the main comment that I will have is patience. So that all that we need is to be patient for about another, I think, sometimes I say 30 years, sometimes I say 40 years, uh, 50 years, but I, I, I've averaged it out to be 40 years. So for us to have, for the science to understand subjectivity will take probably another 40 years for how the brain produces subjectivity and such things. So we just need some patience. Present science does not understand how the brain produces subjectivity. Well, we'd love to learn more about your work and what has led you to hold this very compelling view. Oh, it's because I'm an optimist. <laughs> I'm an optimist that I do believe, I, I actually firmly believe that within something like 40 years, we will begin to learn about subjectivity and consciousness. I know Bernie has written about consciousness a lot. And Bernie, I highly respect. Bernie, one of my questions for you is, do you think that consciousness is done in the brain? Because many of the people that I deal with think that consciousness is worldwide and consciousness is in the universe. And I happen to believe that consciousness, and I think Bernie agrees, but I'm not positive, that consciousness is done in our brains. But consciousness and subjectivity 
are the main things that we presently know almost, I would say we know 50% of what's needed. So there's a huge amount of research in the next 40 years that will tell us about how consciousness is produced and how subjectivity is produced. Otherwise, present science is incredibly able to do all sorts of things. I mean, I have this little gadget here that is more powerful, I mean, probably a thousand times more powerful than the bigger... That's your cell phone. This is my computer. Yeah, it's a cell phone. It's called a cell phone. So anyway, so that's my shtick, is that subjectivity and consciousness... For us to understand how they are produced, I'm an optimist on that. I think within 40 years, we will have a deep understanding of this very important topic that Bernie has put a lot, a, a lifetime of thought into. And I'll be very eager to hear whether Bernie uh, agrees with me that within 40 years, we'll be able to finally understand how the brain produces uh, consciousness and subjectivity. You know, as you know, of course, Stan is a, both a wonderful friend and also an extraordinarily good scientist. And Stan, if I can ask you a leading question here, your first PhD was in physics from Caltech. Is that correct? No, it's not. My undergraduate bachelor's degree was from Caltech. And then I had to decide where to go to, for graduate school. And my main choice was this place called Berkeley. And my second choice was Brandeis. My bachelor's degree was in physics. And I wanted to go physics for graduate school. And Berkeley was number one on my list. But then I learned that there were lots of other applicants to Berkeley. And I would probably not be... I wasn't smart enough to be a theorist, and they would make me into an experimentalist. And I knew that I wasn't good at experimenting. So I went to Brandeis for my PhD in physics. So I, I graduated Brandeis at, at, in 1967. And right around that time, there was something called string theory that became central to physics. And string theory was not really physics. It was mathematics, and it was beyond my shtick. And so I switched from being doing physics to more neuroscience stuff and other things. This is really highly relevant, Stan. So let me ask uh, just a quickie. If you think about yourself in terms of your intellectual journey, how your beliefs developed and changed, would your bachelor's degree in physics be a major landmark in your own thinking? Um, well, again, maybe I'll be repetitious. I learned that when string theory came out and all the physics became very mathematical, and I found it was above my head. So I wonderfully switched fields to more neuroscience and biophysics -y things. So anyway, so I, I stopped being a physicist in the mid-70s. And I, that was a smart thing for me to do because uh, physics became fairly uh, uh, complicated. <laughs> but I, anyway, I, I, I still know physics. And one of my claims to fame is when I was at Caltech, I got a summer job in a biology lab, and that taught me something about biology. And this guy, um, Richard Feynman, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a big shot. Great and, physicist. And, 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 and so I, uh, he was in the same lab. And so they, for my first article, my first publication was co-authored with Feynman. And... Uh, <laughs> Can't do better than that. <laughs> cannot, cannot do better than that. Right. I, I, I could take my computer and show you, I, I have about 20 Feynman books, either by him or about him. Oh, really? But Feynman is my hero. And he, he wrote a lot of books for the public. I mean, most of his books actually were just for the public stories and... Anyway, Feynman is, is my hero. Oh, I didn't give you my full... Let me give you a little bit of my full Yes, history. please. Okay, so I went to Brandeis and graduated there in 67. And you might be aware that because of the Second World War, 
atom bombs and blah, 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 pen. Physics became a big deal. And a lot of people wanted to become physics-y people. And so the number of physicists in the 60s, there was a lot of physics people produced. And I applied to this college and that college. And there were just too many applicants. So I went back to the near where my parents live, near Caltech. It's a place called Claremont um, in Southern California. And so I taught in Claremont for 14 years. And it was, it's, a, it's a small group of colleges in Claremont. That's the first part of my career was teaching undergrads at Scripps, Spitzer, and uh, Claremont Men's College. It, it uh, might be worth saying that uh, those colleges are extremely important in fields like physics and science and math and all that kind of stuff. Is no, no, no. Scripps was a total women's college. Very few sciencey folks there. But the good news was that I dated one of those Scripsy, one of there the Scripps girls. And uh, we got married. We produced the two most wonderful children in the world, <laughs> my two daughters. And so that, that was very lucky. But then she wisely, because I was, I was at that point writing articles, whether it was uh, on well, some on physics, but some on other things. And uh, I might not have been spending enough time with the children and with Sally. So she divorced me. She, she kicked me out after about 15 years of marriage. And that was the best thing that could have happened because then I ran off to Houston and I got a nice job in University of Houston in teaching statistics. And then there's a place that was looking for a statistics person, a place called Berkeley. And for some reason, the clinicians voted for me, whereas all the big shots at Berkeley uh, went for the more famous people. And, and those were optometrists, is that right? Yeah, yeah, and in the School of Optometry, yeah, yeah. This is, I'm talking about the School of Optometry at Berkeley. And I was in the School of Optometry in Houston, and I was totally qualified because of my, six, my, year, my, my years in, in Houston. I was qualified to teach statistics to optometry students. <laughs> And so that, because of that, I, I got my job at Berkeley, which is a fairly big shot place to be. <laughs> yes, exactly. Stanley, I wanted to ask you, as you were um, summarizing your extensive career, how did you get involved in subjectivity in the first place? Subjectivity and consciousness are the two main mysteries that are still facing science. Modern science has gone in huge directions and, and, and it solved many, many problems, but subjectivity and consciousness are still the two big mysteries of how the brain does it. Now, a lot of people think that consciousness and Bernie knows more than any of us how, how to deal with the word consciousness. And I think Bernie is on the science side. Bernie is science. I would like radical. to think so also. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a large number of people that I'm on the email groups of. A large fraction of intelligent people think that consciousness is not just in the brain, but consciousness is in the universe. And they have a very different meaning of consciousness than what Bernie and I uh, consider to be consciousness. And that's a shame because that word consciousness um, is, is, has become meaningless. A good fraction of the public has a very different interpretation. And I'm eager to hear Bernie's thoughts on that, since I consider you to be Mr. Consciousness. <laughs> ah, well, thank you. I, I'll accept that uh, for the time being. I think we're all uh, Mr. Consciousness or Miss Consciousness or trans-consciousness or something like that. I, uh, I think we all have great depth of personal encounter with consciousness. There's no way to avoid it, obviously. And so I think we're all sentient conscious creatures. And then the enormous scientific challenge is, of course, figuring out what that really means. Yeah. Oh, Bernie, can I ask you, is your understanding of how you use the word consciousness, is that 
being done in our brain, or is there an aspect that's outside of the brain? Well, let me briefly put this in terms of you and I, Stan, and our somewhat different views of what has happened and what will continue to be happening as best we can predict it. I think there is a universe of nature and consciousness, to the best of our evidence, emerges in a very tiny, tiny piece of nature, in a very tiny set of living species, and every single known form of consciousness lives, to the best of our current knowledge, in this sliver of the universe, we can think about it, around planet Earth. And that includes, you know, deep in the ground, there are bacteria, and a little bit higher up, there are, there's a whole uh, series of life forms, animal life forms, as well as plant life forms, under the Earth that we rarely see, but biologists have studied them forever. And then, of course, living on the surface of the Earth, like ourselves, and both deep in the watery parts of the Earth, and on the surface of the watery parts of the Earth, and then in the thin envelope of atmosphere. And there are, turns out to be, uh, there's quite a spectacular array of life forms, bacteria, but also bigger life forms, floating in and on top of the atmosphere. But when you think about those Earth, air, and water, you have specified pretty much the sliver of nature where consciousness can be found. And there is lots of speculation and prediction that other conscious life forms will be found, but we have to be really careful and realize what is a speculation and sometimes a prediction and what is actually known. What we know is this um, 100-mile skin of the Earth within which all conscious life forms that we know can be found. And so this is slightly different from Stan's perspective, and the two of us have very complementary perspectives. We recognize pretty much the same evidence, scientific evidence. Scientific evidence is basically a way of talking about provable evidence of any kind. It's really larger than what we call science. And I see nature as sort of the outer envelope. And within nature, we have conscious animals, not plants, to the best of our knowledge, and animals that are also enormously unconscious, because consciousness and unconscious processes play together very, very beautifully then we have any number of life forms that do not support consciousness to the best of our ability to know today. And that's basically it. So the great difference between Stan and myself, see if you accept this, Stan, and you should certainly comment on it. My sense is that the cosmos is nature. And within nature, we see conscious life forms with nervous systems consisting of neurons, that's the most visible part, but of course neurons are not only the cellular level of analysis. Uh, Neurons come in enormous aggregations that have mass action, it's been called, properties that go beyond single neurons. And then we have all kinds of similar entities in our world, including computers and so on, and including Stan's cell phone, which are like biological information processors, but so far they are not identical to biological information processes, which are all, to the extent of our knowledge, they're all animals with fairly formidable nervous systems. I don't know if Stan would have a different description of the universe. Oh, 
Um, yeah, I, I think you are correct that there are multiple definitions of the word consciousness. And I think that's one of the things that has produced a lot of confusion. Yes. My suggestion is to put a prefix, three letter uh, something, to clarify which meaning of consciousness we want to talk about. And I like to use the word consciousness as the sort of thing that animals, you know, dogs, humans have. And I'm claiming that the machinery for producing that consciousness is in our brain. Now, a lot of people disagree, and that's because of the confusion by the meaning of that word. And the thing that you presented sounded like you were using the word consciousness in that more generalized approach. Is, is that correct? Actually, I do the usual scientific trick of evading definitions until you have enough relevant evidence to know what you're talking about. And this is absolutely standard in the history of science, and it's often forgotten today. And I blame Stan's colleagues in physics for thinking that we know, in, in some conceptual theoretical sense, what consciousness could be. No, no, no. Consciousness is not a, an aspect of physics. That's more biology and neuroscience. Yeah, uh, I physics, fully agree. Phys physics doesn't deal with things like how the brain works. It's, um, that's more like neuroscience. Right. You and I are in agreement on almost everything, Stan. And then we use words somewhat differently, but not, all, not incompatibly. Uh, well, your, your definition of consciousness is different from my definition of consciousness, it sounds like, from what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, exactly. But when science grows, which is practically all the time, and especially when science undergoes transitions, definitions fall apart. So if you go back to Galileo and the Italian Renaissance, he had an extraordinarily important concept of gravitational attraction on Earth. And he did the basic experiments, basically, that he still referred to, and this is 500 years ago. And the, the experiments were extremely simple, and they basically led to everything else. So that we have 500 years of excellent and universally acknowledged scientific work on No, gravity. no, Galileo was wrong. No. Ah. No, Galileo was wrong. Tell me about it. Oh, well, there's this guy, Einstein, who showed that Galileo, well, Newton showed that, Newton made some advances, but it was mainly Einstein that showed that Galileo and, and, and Newton were, were just plain wrong about how gravity, um, and about that stuff. And so Einstein uh, had some wisdom on that. Good. That's clearly true. And then also Einstein, who was a deeply informed physicist who really understood the base of evidence as it emerged over 500 years, roughly since the Renaissance. So Einstein surely knew about Galileo's fundamental experiments uh, using very simple wooden blocks on wooden sliding planes, just tilted really? at different really? angles. Yeah. I didn't know. That's not, okay, that's correct, but that's not what he's famous for. Well, yes, uh, uh, I'm talking about reality, not what people think about reality. Uh, pardon you, me. That, that, was, that was a little bit too snarky. You know, Galileo made some great discoveries about how, you know, how gravity works, about the planets going around the sun. Galileo figured that out. Absolutely. And as you say that, Stan, I notice your finger is twirling in the air to illustrate your point. Yep. And what that means to me, if I can jump on an interpretation of, of your words and actions, is that you think about gravity in the solar system in terms of what we talk about as the solar system, the one that we know the most about. 
And Galileo was Italian, so naturally he was very argumentative and very intelligent. So I think Galileo evolved actually within his lifetime from his fundamental experiment on gravity with the sliding planes and so on, uh, to his observations, some of the earliest telescope operations, which revealed a solar system that stunned people and actually shocked people so much at the time that took them time and a lot of debate to understand Galileo's observations of the moons of Jupiter for example, which were stunning and revolutionary. I would only add to that that in the physics of the time, which includes Newton, what was happening was a unification of two very different approaches to gravity. Uh, One of them involves cannonballs and dropping things from towers and sliding planes, or rather sliding blocks off angled planes, and the other one, the other part of the universe was the orbits of the planets around the sun. And Newton, for example, realized, and Stan is really the the real physicist here, uh, but I believe that Newton realized that those two ways of thinking about gravitational attraction on Earth are really the same. And it's that unification uh, which was mind-boggling and in many ways still is mind-boggling. And now let's give Stan a chance to correct me on that. Yeah, I would be delighted to correct you. (laughs) No, no, it's not that correct. It's not a matter of correcting you because what you said was correct. But what Galileo came up with from measuring the orbits of the various planets was that the And now I hope everybody's sitting down because uh, in the olden days, you would have fallen off your seat. Galileo came up with the idea that the earth was rotating around the sun, whereas all the other, especially the Pope and the religious folks said, no way. The earth is the center of the universe. And so Galileo violated the present church's view, and he was put in prison. He was bound to his home. House arrest. House arrest. (laughs) He couldn't travel. They didn't kill him. (laughs) All the big shots put Galileo in in, in his home prison, and um, that's where he stayed for the rest of his life, apparently. You're right. And his famous last words, at least uh, to the <laughs> Vatican office of the Inquisition, yeah. <laughs> was in Italian, Puril se muove, which means, but it moves. <laughs> and he was talking about both the planets as they go around the sun, but also the earth as it goes around its own axis, of course. Yeah, that was Galileo's big, big thing. That was revolutionary. And very appropriately dramatic, given the fact that Galileo was Italian. And the Renaissance, of course, started in Italy as a kind of a rediscovery of the great past. Yep, yep. So Galileo was, that was a pretty dramatic thing that he did to put the sun at the center and the earth being just a tiny little planet (laughs) twiddling around the sun. (laughs) Uh, So that was pretty brave of him to... uh, It was very brave, but of course, it's the starting role in any Italian opera. So I'm sure he had some degree of performance anxiety, (laughs) which was rightly so because who's the man, uh, famous man, uh, the name starts with Bruno, who actually was burned at the stake, although he wasn't all that great a scientist, actually, as it turns out, but he was a great heretic. Real scientists, I think, people we consider to be real scientists, generally tended to avoid the stake in clever ways, like Copernicus, for example, who's another 
great, great actor in this drama, mm -hmm. anticipated so much trouble with the Inquisition and mm -hmm. so much did not want to be tortured and burned at the stake that he arranged to publish his greatest book on the rotation of the planets in Latin. He arranged to have it published after his death. After his death, yeah. So he cheated yeah. the Inquisition uh, <laughs> very cleverly. And some yeah. friends, I do not know the details of this, yeah. but, but some yeah. very loyal friends managed yeah. to publish his book on the revolution of the yeah. spheres. Uh, there should be multiple revolutions of the spheres. Somehow, even though it did get on the list of prohibited books, and the Inquisition did try to eliminate and censor and cancel Galileo's revolutionary work. Also, of course, Copernicus's revolutionary work, because there were two great actors in that drama. Yep. But it escaped. Uh, the book escaped. And that itself is an important story. Yep. No, that's a very, very important topic. Yeah. It's, it's always shocking to me that Galileo had such a problem in convincing the general public that he was right. Anyway. You know, that is a fundamentally important topic. It's fundamentally important today, just like it was fundamentally important 500 years ago. And as a kind of an amateur historian, I like to see parallels, as well as differences between the past and the present. I think that in the present, we have cancel culture. And in the past, we have hundreds and thousands of cancel cultures. And I'm sorry, is, can you, what culture? Cancel culture? Cancel culture. What is that? It's a pop word for people getting canceled on Twitter oh. and Facebook and other internet media for saying outrageous things in very much the way that Galileo and Copernicus and a few others said outrageous things. And at least one of the outrageous folks was actually burned at the stake to encourage all the others, basically to scare the daylights out of everybody. And this is obviously a major aspect of the history of science. And the only thing as an amateur historian that I would say is that cancel culture has been around. Socrates was forced to commit suicide because he was canceled, let's say, around 500 BC in Athens. Jesus was canceled for saying the wrong thing. In Jerusalem, 500 years later, Copernicus got canceled in late 1400s, 1500s, something like that. Galileo got canceled, but allowed to go home without getting tortured. And Copernicus... Copernicus was killed? I, I didn't... How did Copernicus die? He died with a lot of careful manipulation, he died a natural death. Oh, okay. Yeah. But he evaded the, the Inquisition or whatever yeah. the establishment orthodoxy was at the time. He evaded that fate by not publishing in his oh. own lifetime. Oh, really? And so they couldn't get him, <laughs> although they, they suspected because he was hinting at things, you know. <laughs> but he waited, you know, and it was a publication lag, just one of those things. And uh, one of the very important things about all that is that this is right at the beginning of printing of books uh, being oh, okay. popularized. So suddenly, sure, right. if you wrote a extraordinarily wonderful book, like the books of Copernicus and Galileo and a few others, Newton later on, if you got your book in print, suddenly there were thousands of copies that you could make fairly cheaply. Right. And these were circulated often in secret by mostly amateurs. Everybody was an amateur at that time. Nobody was a professional physicist. 
So mostly among enthusiastic amateurs who lived in the few countries where it was safe to talk yeah. about these things. Yeah. You know, my, my opinion, and I could be wrong, is that nowadays the um, mainstream educated, the people who have gone to college, let's say, have fairly much agreement on how nature is working. And that's because present science has done things like producing computers, these little cell phones that are just incredible compared to what we had 20 years ago. I mean, it's just the progress has made life just so much easier and better. So I think there's amazing progress and I don't see too much, um, well, except we have Republicans and Democrats and, and Bernie, I know you have some ideas on how politics works that are different than others. And so it's a little bit confusing, but by and large, it seems to me there is general agreement on how the world works. Yeah, I totally agree with this slight modification because if there's one thing that we're good at, people who are scholars and scientists and so on, is arguing with each other. <laughs> and we get very subtle differences that are usually invisible to other people, but we care about the differences. And actually, the differences are quite important. So if you look at these huge transitions in the history of science, which are just like huge transitions in the history of human beings, except that scientists try to define their terms with great precision. So at least we can agree upon the observations, even if we do not agree on the interpretation of those observations. And then there's a huge debate and everybody argues and people try to publish one idea and then another idea. And the, the argument, the debate is actually very productive. It's very fruitful. And without that argument, we tend to get stuck in very fixed positions. And the good thing about dialogue is that there's two sides. And, and the two sides somehow, desperately, very often, try to communicate with each other in ways that are very challenging. And, and one of our friendly disagreements between Stan and myself is that we both recognize the same nature and we both would talk about what we believe to be science in almost identical ways, but our interpretations are in some ways drastically different. And this is not just a debate about philosophy or even metaphysics. It is a reflection of the fact that we have different life experiences, life courses. And I would think, but uh, correct me, of course, then, that Richard Feynman, who was an extraordinary physicist, uh, just very brilliant, as well as very entertaining and a very great teacher at Caltech, that Feynman's conception of science, which appears in many places, of course, but especially in his wonderful textbook, which every physics student and maybe every college student should study, certainly Stan has done so. So Feynman's interpretation of physics was really very, very important. And really? Fein I, don't, I don't agree. Well, please. Please go ahead. Feynman's uh, theory of physics was fairly standard. The, 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 only rev the only big revolution in physics took place in the middle 1920s. That was the big revolution. They totally changed how physics worked. So Einstein did a major revolution earlier. But in the 1920s, they, um, instead of a particle, you know, like an electron or a photon being a particle, it was discovered in the 1920s um, that it, it, the electron or the photon or the gluon or the whatever could be a particle and a wave. Right. 
a particle is localized, a wave is spread out. And so that was a major revolution. And there's nothing in, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, whatever, there were lots of discoveries and improvements, minor things, but nothing revolutionary like what happened in 1920. A wave is all spread out, a particle is all narrow, and that um, the big revolution in the 1920s was the realization of how a photon or an electron or a quark or whatever, that these things were waves and particles. So I always use the word wavicle. And I'm not the only one. Good, good. So matter is made up of wavicles, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense because a wave is all spread out and the particle is all close together. And um, that's a single electron or a single photon or a single whatever can start out in, like a double slit experiment. You have, you, you release, say, let's talk about an electron. And an electron goes through two slits. One electron can go through two slits, which makes no sense. And those two parts of the electron, when they hit the detector, then get um, actualized into the detector. And so um, in the middle, it's a wave, and then it ends up being a particle, that same one electron <laughs> or, or photon or whatever. You're right. And it makes no sense, but that's what present science, that's present physics, is all based on that. And that's why I have my duality um, Right, to, to display to the world as you drive around in Berkeley and adjacent cities. Uh, and, and what did this guy Einstein think about all this weird business about... He didn't like it. He didn't like it. Right. Why not? Well, because it doesn't make any sense. How can an electron be a wave, which is all spread out, and a particle? It doesn't make logical sense. <laughs> yeah, but Einstein was a great scientist. And in 1905, as you obviously know, he published not one, but five revolutionary papers in physics. And we don't have to go through all the five, but he received a Nobel Prize. All kinds of people liked his stuff and argued with him, which is mainly what scientists do. But he refused, he really disliked this weird stuff. You've already talked about it, the wave particle and the utter weirdness of the theory of the cosmos that emerged at that time. And everybody agrees that Einstein was a, a major, major scientist. And as Stan has pointed out, he made us redefine the concept of gravity based on his 1905 papers. But I want to remind Stan, which is a very arrogant thing to do, and I do apologize for this, Stan, that the Eddington expedition to Africa to observe the way in which sunlight travels around the moon during an eclipse and it was, uh, let me know. Uh, yes, yes, please. I think you're talking about a 1915 Einstein. Anyway, yeah, but what we're saying is correct, that uh, in 1919, there were some experiments that showed that Einstein's general theory of relativity, this was 1915, was correct. So he comes up this, he, meaning Einstein, comes up with these weird ideas, publishes them around 1915, and the evidence, the observational evidence that people considered to be conclusive, although you bet there was probably a lot, a lot of argument at that time, uh, but the evidence comes in, what's your take on that? Well, the evidence came that the theories of the 1920s was correct. Einstein didn't like it. And Einstein, and this is, we're talking now the 1920s, Einstein tried coming up with alternative ways in which nature could work that wasn't as crazy as this wave-particle duality right. business. Einstein did not like the wave and particle, uh, which made no sense in those days. And it turned out Einstein was wrong. And in his later years, um, he accepted it in the 1930s and 
40s. Einstein had to accept. He kept on trying to uh, modify, trying to figure out a way in which the wave particle duality could be made sensible. <laughs> right. And uh, Einstein failed. And the wave particle duality is still wonderfully with us. <laughs> uh huh. And it doesn't make any logical sense. So logic used to be wonderful, but um, present science has this weird duality of the wave particle physics that the way physics works is awesome, <laughs> but it isn't logical. <laughs> right. I would, again, as an amateur historian, I would see similarities between the uh, famous uh, scholars at the University of Padua in Italy who refused to look through, supposedly, <laughs> through uh, Galileo's telescope, had an early right. telescope, which was pretty right. pretty, but right. still good enough uh, to show very interesting right. and surprising things, shocking right. things at the time, like the moons of Venus. Right. And so his colleagues, apparently, uh, smart people, uh, very smart people, simply yep. refused to look, and this kind of a famous movie scene about all these marvelously dressed uh, scholars kind of from the Middle Ages with these wonderful graduation gowns. They weren't graduation gowns yep. at the time, of course, but we think of them as graduation gowns. And they're coming kind of in, in, a, in a little squad marching along on the Padua wonderful, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> campus. And Galileo yeah. supposedly is, is yelling at them, come and watch, come and watch, Say, look through the telescope. And they supposedly sneered at him and walked away. They didn't want to see it. Uh, and that is, I think, a human universal. There's all kinds of things that we don't want to see. In fact, there are things I can tell you that I don't want to see. And then, there, of course, there are some things that we yell at each other to come and see. And right. if there is a difference between myself and Stan, which is not major, it's that I'm very interested in the dialogue between observations and theory. And so is Stan, of course. But Stan believes the theories that come out of it. And I think they're pretty amazing. But I have two levels of belief, I guess, where... I believe what Galileo was seeing through his telescope, and I also believe the theoretical ideas that were so hotly debated at that time. Stan and I are having this metaphysical fight, and Stan is right, and I'm wrong. But then, on the other hand, sometimes we're both right, but we're not both right in <laughs> ways that we, you know, can agree on every syllable of the way in which I think Stan is right, which I do. And I also think that I'm right because I've been trying to be right forever, just like Stan has. And what we're seeing, what appears to be a difference between us is really part of the duet that appears in science and other parts of real life, of course, it appears all, all the time, where you seem to be having an argument, but you're really searching for where you agree and where you disagree. And in the history of science, working out the precise way in which you agree with each other and the ones in which you disagree with each other, that precise dialogue is science. Without that dialogue, I would argue that we're not talking about science. We're not even talking about honest scholarship in any other part of the world. I think lawyers argue with each other to gain clarity in problems, very, very difficult problems of law and ethics. Insurance salespeople argue with each other in order to establish the price of risk Married people, family members argue with each other in order to establish a shared understanding and a shared misunderstanding of life. And it's the dialogue that is uh, 
in my view, both the opportunity to disagree and also the opportunity to find common ground. So that's my commercial here. So we're doing the same thing. We both try to do scientific thinking, and we both look at established facts and novel facts that keep on creeping up on us in unexpected ways. So we do science in the best way that we know how, and we agree with each other on, I think, just about every single fact. Well, but you would agree, I presume, that you have some opinions that are not fully compatible with modern science, as I recall, that you have some objections. Yeah, so here's the thing that's really important. You have a view of modern science, and I have a view of modern science, and they're both uh, well-based in enormous amounts of evidence. So I like to tell people to take a look at Uh, what I think is the greatest treasury of documented science on the web, which is very easy to find on a website called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, dot government, dot G-O-V. And whenever I have a moment of doubt about what's true and what's not, I go to PubMed and type into the search engine whatever I'm curious about, uh, which is practically everything in the biosciences, which includes psychology. And I type in conscious brain. That's my favorite right now. And what comes up is between 2,500 and sometimes 20,000 articles, all of them from excellent peer-reviewed journals, journals that are very, very reputable and generally quite respected, when we don't argue about them, which is all the time. So that's my treasury of what I think is considered to be science by people who are working right now. So all kinds of extraordinary brain discoveries keep on showing up in PubMed. And I talk about PubMed simply because it's an enormous simplification. It's what the computer age stands cell phone has contributed to our ability to understand the universe. And then people who spend their lives trying to understand the universe, like Stan, goes to his sources and he defines what he considers to be science, which is a true and well-supported definition So Stanley, basically, in the early to mid 20th century, physics was a very popular field, as you mentioned. A lot of scientists flocked to it, partially inspired by the discoveries of the early minds of the 20th century and World War II. However, after the 50s and the 60s, and that's when we had string theory, it feels like the field has been more or less stagnant. Have we hit a brick wall? What do we need to do to get back on those great discoveries in order to maybe figure out dark matter or dark energy? Do we need more computational power, more computers, or do we just need more human beings behind a project? How do we move physics to the next level? You wanted to know what is my idea of what the future might be? The future is going very well. The future is going to do, you know, wonderful things. The uh, the big issue for the future is climate change. And I'm fairly optimistic that the world will figure out how to deal with climate change. I'm disappointed right now that not enough is being done. The, the Republicans are not supporting climate change. They don't believe that there's a problem. But, you know, I think it'll gradually, uh, and the rest of the world, other than the United States, I think is going to be doing well. And even the United States uh, should be doing well. But the way the government is working is things are not going very well. Uh, Biden's not able to get done with the things he wants to do. But I'm an optimist that it'll get better. So Stan Klein, a professor of the University of California, Berkeley, 
in vision science and also at the, let me get this right, Stan, uh, also at the optical department, that's not the right word. What's the, what is the right word? No, the, 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 you said it okay. I'm, I'm at the uh, UC Berkeley School of Optometry. School of Optometry. Exactly. So Stan has worked for many years on vision science, and he has a very strong and well-founded view of how the science of vision has developed and how it will probably continue to grow. And so there is a crucial moment here in the history of science that people involved with the field see very clearly. And it's very hard often for people who live regular lives, who live in the real world, to get the perspective from science. And the part of the reason, I think, and let's see if Stan agrees, is that scientists are usually in dialogue with each other. And what works in the dialogue is both the things that you agree on, which are essential, and also the points of disagreement, because out of those points of disagreement, it is possible that the future will emerge. And let's give Stan a, a chance to say yes or no. Well, you, you mentioned what my past research was on, and that was correct. But my present and I'm hoping my future research will be on climate change. I think that climate change, how to deal with climate change, is by far the most important thing that science can deal with. The standard physics needs to figure out how to deal with climate change. So that's my main suggestion for what the future will be. And let me, if it's okay with you, let me bring this back to your very, very grounded conception of science. How do you see that future and how does that future interact with your concern about the planet? Oh, the notion of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. That's a very important and complex topic. And so science, whether it's physics or chemistry or probably even more, it's the neuroscience, it's, it's the psychology of people on how to deal with climate change, how to make civilization function in a way that our great-grandchildren will have a happy life. Because if we aren't careful, the lives of our future generations will be miserable. We have to limit the population, blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of complex things that climate change brings up. And so that's what I'm wanting to vote my interests to. I think that's a very important topic. Right now, we're talking about subjectivity. And actually, maybe we can sew this up by asking, does subjectivity have any relevance to your perception of where humanity is at right now? Thank you, Bernie. That's a very good question. And I'll, I, I mentioned it earlier, and I'll just repeat myself. I'm an optimist on the topic of subjectivity and consciousness. I'm an optimist that within 40 years, some progress will be made. And I know Bernie has written a number of books and articles on, on, on consciousness. And thank you, thank you. You're one of the most productive persons on that field. And I'm confident that within 40 years, we'll figure out how the brain does it. <laughs> it's, it's the greatest mystery uh, facing, in my opinion, the greatest mystery facing present science is figuring out how consciousness and subjectivity is done by our brains. And, uh, and I'm optimistic that the research will, um, in 40 years, will have something figured out. And you think that interacts with your very strong commitment to understanding climate change? No, there's no connection. No, the climate change topic is 
how our grandchildren or great grandchildren will have a happy life. And that's a project for, you know, the government, blah, 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 for the whole, you know, how to make society work. And the other topic of how the brain works is a sciency topic of how does the brain produce consciousness and subjectivity. So those are two different things. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman. I think that was such a good ending. We ended where we started, basically. We did a full circle with this conversation, but it was great to listen to both of you go from subjectivity to the universe and history of science and philosophy. This was a very, very fruitful conversation. I hope our listeners enjoyed it just as I did. And any final words from both of you? I like this, what we've talked about, because if you listen carefully to Stan, I think what we're talking about is very revealing, not just about the specific topics that we're talking about, but about the process in which human beings learn to survive on this planet and learn to improve things. Yep, very important. So yeah. thank you, thank you, Bernie. It's a thank you for bringing up this very, very I mean, I, I you know, the, the last comment that I made is uh, how to make civilization uh, go into the next 20, 30, 40 years in a successful way. And it's not trivial. Right, it's not trivial. It is not trivial indeed, and science communication is an important tool for all of us to progress as species, as humans. And with that said, I just want to thank you both for this conversation. Thank you so much, Stanley, for being guest on Bernard Barsa's podcast on consciousness. Bernie, as always, thank you so much for having me as a guest interviewer and a aspiring scientist. Um, thank you so much for our listeners as well for tuning in with us. I hope you learned as much as I did. And we'll see you in the next episode. Great. Thank you very much, Elian. To show our appreciation, we are offering our listeners a 50% discount for any edition of Bernie's book on consciousness, science, and subjectivity, updated works on global workspace theory. Just go to shop the nautiluspress.com spelled s h o p dot t h e n a u t i l u s p r e s s dot com and be sure to enter the word books b o o k s in the coupon code box during checkout for that extra 50% savings of course bernie's books are available everywhere books are sold although your 50% discount is only available in the nautilus shop if you'd like to discover more about the conscious brain and learn more about global workspace functions, please visit Bernie's new website at bernardbars.com. And I'm going to spell that also, B-E-R-N-A-R-D-B-A-A-R-S.com. And thank you for listening. <laughs>